Hi, I'm Bridie Shepherd, and on today's episode of The Eco Show, I'm on Bunwurrung and Boonwurrung country in southwest Victoria at the Cape Housing Estate. This is a really unique housing estate as it's leading the way in environmental living. Let's go check it out. The Cape is the first net zero carbon housing estate of this scale in Australia. And it's been designed to showcase a more environmentally and socially sustainable way of living. The Cape incorporates homes, walking and cycling tracks, wetlands and parks, a community farm, and on top of all that, it's located on the beautiful Cape Patterson coastline in Southern Victoria, with the estate producing more than four times the amount of energy that it consumes. While there's still a way to go before we can see this replicated across other newly built estates in Australia, the Cape is now one example builders and developers can look to. I'm visiting the estate today and can't wait to have a look around. But first, I'm meeting with General Manager Clint to learn about what brings residents to the Cape. This is really incredible and also very, very different to most housing estates that we see sort of taking over the suburbs. So what we've tried to do here is make it socially sustainable and environmentally sustainable. So more than half the estate's dedicated to open space. We encourage active forms of transport, walking, cycling, running. So it means that with all of the parklands, wetlands, community infrastructure and walking paths, a lot of neighbours know each other and interact with each other. There's a big community farm which people are loving so far and that really encourages a, a food sharing culture and people share a lot of ideas about living sustainably and what works for them in their homes. So you're really creating a community of like-minded people who have sort of all come from different parts of potentially Victoria to be here together creating this, this amazing sort of sustainable environment. A lot of people are attracted to the Cape for different reasons. We've got a really diverse community here from first home buyers all the way through to uh, downsizers and retirees and what brings them to the Cape differs, but they all appreciate low energy bills and I think they all feel pretty good about reducing their emissions and their carbon footprint as well. And I think a lot of folk are surprised when they get here, if they're drawn to the Cape for its environmental credentials, that they're enjoying the social aspects so much too. Pocket parks and nice paths to walk around. And we're an environmental net gain project, so we've planted about half a million native plants, which has drawn in a lot of native bird life and, and other animals. This is something I absolutely love about really good environmental design is that it, you know, is looking after the environment, it's looking after nature, but it's also looking after the people who live there. You know, you can have these open plan designs which also encourage different social networks to sort of grow and you can sort of see the way that it's supporting people as well as supporting the environment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Houses can be designed by any architect or constructed by any builder as long as they follow the Cape's energy efficient design guidelines. This means they need a minimum seven and a half Energy Star rating, which exceeds the national minimum of six stars. They also need to have a 2.5 kilowatt solar system and 10,000 litres of rainwater storage per home. Everything looks quite unique here, which I think is the first thing that struck me upon driving in. There was no sort of cookie cutter houses. Each one has its own personality, but they look like they're really sort of integrated into the environment. Yeah, and it's really important that we are able to mainstream all sorts of houses so that people don't feel as though they're shoehorned into one particular aesthetic if they want to live a more sustainable life. So we've got tiny houses all the way through to the larger houses which are about 200 square metres of living area and that's our cap. We've got designers from all over Australia who've worked here and architects and quite a lot of builders now too. So probably half a dozen builders working on site mm -hmm. at the moment and probably a dozen builders have built here in the last couple of years. It's incredible. Sounds like a community I would love to be a part of but how do the houses here differ from other estates? Well, to start with, all houses built at the Cape use passive solar design. This means the orientation of the house invites in lots of sun in the winter that hits thermal mass, such as concrete floors and brick walls, which absorbs the heat and slowly releases it into the space over time. There's shading on the outside of the house which prevents the sun from hitting thermal mass in the summer and ensures the house is at comfortable temperature all year round, without having to rely heavily on air conditioning systems. 
you're really noticing that there is an emerging market and sort of more conscientious uh, homeowners out there. Without a doubt, yeah. I think the more people come through these homes and realise how warm they can be passively in the middle of winter and how cool they can be without running an AC in the middle of a heat wave, they want the same. And when they understand that it doesn't really cost any more to put a window in the right place as it does to put it in the wrong place, they want the same when they're building new homes. Yeah, it's remarkable even just sitting here, there's no heating on and, you know, still in winter. And it's really lovely and warm. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. yeah, this is a great house. I love touring people through the homes at the Cape in, in the middle of the morning or the first part of the morning in the middle of winter. Probably when uh, the importance of passive solar design is really evident. Yeah, and I think all the plants that are flourishing indoors are really a testament to the natural light as well. Heaps of natural light in the middle of winter and not much of the sun's direct light coming in in summer. I'm about to head out for a stroll with builder and resident Tony. He's built 70 houses at the Cape, averaging nearly 8.1 stars on every house. I know there's a lot of noise in the background about how hard it is to build sustainable good houses, but if you get your orientation and your layouts and your design right, it's actually pretty simple. So buildings, yeah, that's how we've come to be involved here. Yeah, so I know there's some sort of like quite high tech uh, environmental houses here, but um, you can also keep it quite simple, quite affordable. Yeah, and that, that for me is one of our, our biggest points. Sustainability has to be affordable. If you make it all high tech and um, a lot of product driven and becomes expensive, people can't afford it. And it's one of the things with as you know our summers get hotter, our winters are getting colder, if you can build houses that hold that thermal range sort of between 15, 16 degrees as their coldest up to about 24 um, and you can do it affordably, people can afford to live in the home. So the homes cost a little bit more to build but not significantly more but people save that much on their power bills. And what's the feedback that you're getting from people who have moved into these homes? Getting some amazing feedback. I, I get clients send me pictures of their power bill and they're, like, they're in credit so they're actually not paying a power bill um, and they're just blown away because you know they're living in the house a lot and they're not even turning the heater on over winter the house just holds that comfortable temperature a lot of it comes back to the initial design and that's probably been the hesitancy in the industry is they want to be able to put a house on any block whereas we have to think a little bit and make sure we get our our orientations right but the buildability of the houses they just go together they're very simple there's nothing complex in them it's just a few extra steps in sealing them so that things like our blower door tests that we do on every house, we can, we can actually prove that we're building a house better than what the standard is. The blower door test uses a large fan to extract air from a house and measures how much external air is leaking in. Even with all the doors closed, air can leak in from unexpected places like around the window frames and through power points. The average Australian house leaks about 15 times its volume per hour so you could be heating or cooling an entire volume of your house every four minutes to keep it at a comfortable temperature. If you can build it and build it affordably, um, it's got to be something that we've got to look at into the future. We've got to lift the standards in Australia because we're a long way behind the rest of the world. Mm. Tad, who is also a builder and resident at the Cape, is halfway through his own build, which means we are lucky enough to get a peek inside at the process. You're quite connected in the community here? Uh, yeah, I've, I've lived at Cape for the last 30 years. In 2004, a, uh, a developer uh, came along and was going to develop the land that we're on now. There was a big backlash in the local community over this. The developer uh, held a public meeting. I was one of the lynch mob to go down and lynch this guy for destroying my little coastal hamlet. And uh, the story that he told was, was amazing with what he wanted to uh, achieve here and I've been on board with the project ever since. You're really doing a lot of really interesting things with your own house. Yep. Can you talk me through some of the different things that you're designing? It's a passive solar design, so we have lots of north-facing glass. You'll see behind me that we have an internal membrane and that, that helps with um, drafts. A lot of homes are very leaky these days and people are trying to heat a room that is exchanging air internally from all the leaks outside anything up to 15 or 30 times an hour which mm. that you know so that increases all your heating and cooling load so we've we've gone over and above with here so we've got our membrane and that that stops all the leaks the air leaks so we should get an air exchange of probably one or two 
uh, air exchanges an hour, so it, it'll be a very stable environment in, inside. Other things that we do, we've got the ocean to the south of us, so we're able to train all those cooling breezes in summer that come off the ocean through the house. So you'll see over here, I've got a, a doorway that runs through and then I can open up the uh, living room window and we'll just get, get a cool breeze uh, coming through if we need to cool the house down a little bit. Yeah, so you're getting all of the ocean breeze coming yeah. straight through and you can open that up in, in summer to cool it down, but in winter it's going to be uh, double glazed and it's not going to sort of, That's right. none of that breeze is going to come in. We're able to keep our back. Yeah, yeah, from the wind and, and, and concentrate on all the nice sun that, that comes in through the uh, northern windows. Incredible. Yeah, and th these features aren't, um, they don't increase the, the, the value of the house. Being a building designer, we can design homes that are really efficient but using uh, current building methods. And, and it's just by orientating your house and adding a few little things, make sure we seal up the house really well and make sure the insulation is fitted into the house uh, really, really tight and snug. And if you do those sort of things and, and use the passive solar principles that I've spoken about, you'll get a warm, cosy house that will not cost um, that much to run. Great, can we have a bit of a walk through your, your house? We're currently in the living room, is that right? That's right, yeah, yep. yeah, this is, yeah, we've got, we like to entertain, so we've got a larger uh, living room than normal. But a few little things that I've, uh, that I've done in here, you can see. Yep. As we come around here, so what, what we've got here is, uh, is a drying cabinet. So we're going to put the fridge in through here. Yep. And we get a heat off the back of the fridge. So that, 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 that's in one part of the, the cabinet, and then uh, we, put our clothes in here and dry them overnight off the heat off the back of the fridge. Is that genius? I think, well, that I that's think it's really, really, really simple. I've never seen that before, but what a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So I, all the houses that I've designed and built, um, we, we, we do that. So you don't need to have a dryer. So all your smalls can go in there at night time and, and the next day they're, they're, uh, they're all dry. It's crazy to think how simple some of these techniques are, and yet they have such a dramatic impact on the livability of a home. But houses aren't the only thing that make up the Cape Estate. I'm also pretty keen to hear about the gardens. I've caught up with Clint again for a tour. Every home at the Cape features 10,000 litres of rainwater storage. Mm. Um, and that's used in gardens and in toilets and laundries. And this particular home, any overfill from that tank runs through these garden beds, mm -hmm. which are actually advanced wicking beds and have about 110 litres of storage underneath the uh, soil you can see there. So we've got an extra 3,000 litres of rainwater storage on site. And what that means, by automatically filling when it rains, we're using that resource of rainwater and we're reducing the amount of time spent watering the garden and weeding. So runoff from the roof yeah. goes down into the tanks. Yeah. That's storage, but then there's also storage all underneath these beds. Correct. Yeah. Is that storage also being used to irrigate these veggie beds? That's right, yeah. So they're wicking beds and they have soil cones that allow um, the soil and the plants to drink up that water through capillary action through the soil rather than top watering the more conventional way. That's so cool. It reduces the uh, water loss through evaporation. Um, so really you're losing most of your water through evapotranspiration through yep. the leaves of the plants. Um, Which must be great in summer and those warmer months when you're, you're yeah. losing a lot of the the moisture yet through the soil. Yeah, so this reduces watering by more than 80%. It means we can water these gardens about once a week in summer. So cool. Yeah, and I can see that you've got scaffolding for shade cloth as well. That's right, yeah. yeah so they can, we can protect these beds as well. Um, and the homes in stage one, uh, the runoff from there, rainwater tanks, actually goes down the hill into our community farm, which has more of these garden beds. Again, treating that water as a resource. Yeah. Yeah, so you're definitely producing more water or capturing more water than you can actually use per house. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yep. We love community gardens here on the Eco Show, and the community garden at the Cape is one of the largest that we've seen. There's enough space here for 200 gardeners, and we've got lots of perennials and fruit trees all around the borders, and then we've got hundreds and hundreds of these advanced wicking beds, which the community uses. So who's doing the gardening here? Is it residents? In these beds, it's residents. Yeah. Um, but we also have a market garden and a farmer. So the farmer grows a bunch of produce which is used for the community and we've got a food box scheme coming in soon too. No community garden is complete without a good composting system and this garden has a few. So we treat all of our organic waste as a resource and some of our residents have made these little compost 
bins or worm farms out of recycled timber from building sites, untreated of course, to recycle organics in each of these beds or many of these beds uh, and give a bit of food for the worms. So this one is a, so it's a box that's been made to put compost scraps in and then it's going to slowly decompose. I'm guessing there's a lot of worms in here exactly. and then they're just going to munch on it and munch then just create amazing soil. They're going to munch on it and they're going to take that nutrients out into the rest of the garden bed. So cool. On to the next compost technique, hot compost. Hot composting requires a little more work than cold composting, but it's much quicker to break down. The major difference is that hot compost requires direct sunlight and frequent turning. This compost bay is a hot compost bay and the reaction's happening at about 75 degrees at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that's about 200 mil into the, this pile. And that the, the hot composting process is to, to kill off pathogens, is that right? Yeah, and it, de it composts quicker, so yep. it means you can use the material quicker. It also kills off weed seed, um, which makes a more useful compost. The Cape was previously degraded pastoral land. There were a few remnant tea trees, but aside from that, there was not much biodiversity left. All the native flora and fauna had disappeared. The Sustainable Landscape Company, the team behind the Cape's landscape design, reintroduced species and redeveloped a wetland, and now the environment is thriving. I'm back in Melbourne to catch up with Kate, one of the landscape architects on the project. So when you were restoring the landscape, did you keep those tea tree plants and then sort of build from there? How did you reintroduce uh, the native flora? Yeah, that's actually exactly what we did. We retained those um, patches and made sure that they were patches of remnant vegetation and made sure that they were part of the open space. So, and then we built on them. So in some places they've got more sort of traditional public open space on one side, so an oval and a place for recreation. And then on the other sides of it and other spaces of it, we've got a wetland system. So we've got a drainage corridor. And the inner part of that, we've actually allowed to make sure that kangaroos can come and still use that space because can get quite windy down there and these patches were traditionally used by the kangaroos who love the pasture and then they would sit in these quiet spots so we've made sure that we can accommodate that as well. Yeah when we were down there we saw huge kangaroos just lolling about in these shared spaces and it was really special to see the humans and the non-humans coming together and in this landscape it's beautiful. Yeah. That is one of the beautiful things about the Cape and it's one of the things that is really fundamental to the way it's been designed, certainly from a landscape perspective. There is that real integration of people and animals and the opportunity to see kangaroos and echidnas and walking through those spaces. So that's really fundamental to part of that landscape design, those, those principles. So you've noticed that a lot of uh, wildlife have come back to the area. It's been like quite a successful project, hasn't it? Yeah, that's a really beautiful part of the landscape design is the fact that we were able to integrate humans with all the other flora and fauna so that it's, yeah, it's a much more symbiotic relationship than it is in actual fact, humans and landscape. So there was a lot of principles that we use behind that to bring that into, the, into that sp sort of space. and. And we tend to call that biodiversity sensitive urban design. So the focus is really on looking at how we can incorporate, you know, and increase biodiversity for, in, within those spaces. Wetlands were the, one of the biggest things that we did. We took a whole lot of sort of drainage corridors that were grassy and ponds and steep curves and we flattened everything out a little bit. And then wetlands naturally create multiple habitats and diverse range of habitats to allow birds and critters and lizards and so forth to come back again. Can you tell me about some of the the biosensitive urban design um, that you included in the Cape. Yeah, so some of the things we did was to look at how we integrate people and animals, and that includes people's companion animals as well. So we understand that there are no cats are allowed down there, but we actually built an entire dog park so that people can have their dogs, they can have off-lead dogs, but only in the dog park. So everywhere else dogs have to be on the lead. You know, it doesn't matter how good your dog is, it won't come back sometimes when it sees a wombat or an echidna. So that was one of those things that's, um, that was, you know, quite a big, large, extensive space. And then on the smaller scale, um, some of the things, there's a remnant koala population down at Cape Patterson. So we've been building, um, so we've been planting um, more eucalypt for the koalas. And the other thing too is looking at fences. So we wanted to balance the privacy of the residents with the ability of wildlife to move through the space. So a lot of the fences, they don't come right down to the ground. 
So that doesn't really impact on people's privacy, but it does allow for um, flora and fauna to, to flora and fauna, just fauna, to pass through <laughs> echidnas and, and wombats and so forth. Wetlands really are the other sort of major thing by incorporating wetlands and incorporating how the water moves around the space and creating all those diverse habitats. And it allows people to enter into that space, but also there are some areas that are closed off as well. One of the other things we did was look at how wildlife can actually pass through the space, which is the fences as we talked about, but also creating stepping stones of habitat. So small birds uh, don't cope well with large open spaces, so we really tried to put patches of landscape around so that they had a safe travelling space so that you could end up with really beautiful small birds in your garden because they were able to move from remnant vegetation across the landscape and into your garden. This is the thing I love about really good design because mm. it's there really aren't compromises to the humans. You know, people are still living in these beautiful houses in these beautiful environments, but it's incorporating biodiversity and it's allowing the flora and fauna to also occupy that space. That's the beauty of the, of the design down there is that I think that there's, humans are considered to be kind of at the same level as everybody else. You know, maybe it's that we're having this much more integrated relationship with the landscape and with the natural surroundings. I think all parts of the design do that. So the landscape it does, but the way the houses are situated too, so that people have views of the landscape. So there's lots of opportunity for them to see what's going on around with them with may not necessarily having to interact. So I think it, the whole way it's been put together really allows for people to not take on that primary role, but maybe just sit within the landscape a bit more gently. Mm. The Cape really is a holistic residential space that works with the natural environment rather than against it. I'm really excited to see these design principles become more common practice in future house builds. I'm Bridie Shepherd. thanks for watching The Eco Show.